in the synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed. And so they questioned among themselves, What is this? A new teaching? With authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding regions of Galilee. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. So, think about it. This is his mission statement. This is who Jesus is. Mark 1.15, repent and believe in the gospel. Change your ways and believe in me. And then, who is he? He's one who preaches with authority. And he proves he has the authority by casting out demons, by doing exorcisms. He does not not in the name of God, but in his own name. He just says, he tells them to leave, and they leave. So he proves already in the very, very beginning, he's telling what you what to do, change your ways. He's telling you how to do it, believe in him. And then he's proving you that he has the authority to tell you what he's telling you. Mark's very, the way Mark presents Jesus is very like, well, he's such a bold figure. Change your ways. What you're doing is not right. The way you're living is not right. Change your ways. And casting out demons. The U.S. Catholic Conference of, of Catholic Bishops has on their website question and answer on exorcisms. Yes, as we believe that. People today are still getting possessed by the devil or by demons. In 2015, there was an article uh, of a young boy, I believe he was in Indiana. How do I know this? I was teaching junior high at the time. So, this kid was in the hospital, possessed. He had been possessed for about a year. The parents had tried different people. Check this out. You can Google it. Because you think we all Google it. I mean, nobody does anything else. Anymore. It's actually in the dictionary now. I can Google it. It's a verb. Anyway, this kid in the hospital, witnessed by doctors and nurses, not Catholic, saw the kid walk on the ceiling in the hospital. Witness the fact that it took over six police officers to hold the seven-year-old boy down and heard him speak in languages that he, there's no way he would have known. Who did they bring in? They brought in the Catholic priest, and then apparently that worked. I don't know what happened since, but that was that was you know that was the local Indiana news. That's like imagine that. I would I mean I wouldn't want to see that. Wouldn't want to witness it. Wouldn't want to be around it. Okay, um, but how do you keep the devil away? One, you can carry a rosary and pray a rosary. Two, you can go to confession once a month and go to communion and receive communion every Sunday. For those of you who are starting to do what you're doing, meaning you're not married in the church, right? No, but you're trying to get on that path, trying to work with your husband. Uh, same thing with Eddie. Uh, for those of you, your, your life is probably harder. It's more difficult. The devil's going to put everything in your way to stop you. A nagging spouse, uh, schedules with the kids, tiredness of work, the demands of money, the demands of life. Oh, you shouldn't be doing this, you've got to do this, and you have all these responsibilities. Never realizing that your responsibility is your own salvation and the salvation of your family. The devil is real, right? Is it Jesus? What's your name again? Pedro. Pedro brought up, we were talking a little bit after class, right? A famous quote, right? The, the greatest trick the devil could ever do was convince the world he doesn't exist. And that's where we're at. People think they can do whatever they want, whenever they want, and suffer no consequences. Several things with my son that I do, he's three years old. One, I give him choices. He can't have everything that he wants. He wants to go to sleep with all his toys. I give him two, and then I tell him, pick one. Papa, I want both. No, pick one. This way he learns he can't have it all. He's got to learn how to make choices. Two, throughout the day, we learn to make choices between right and wrong. And then three, that there are consequences. Whenever he's disciplined, I tell him, why were you disciplined? Because I didn't do this. And what happens when you don't do it? And he says one word, consequences. Okay. And, you know, and in the grand scheme of things, my son, who's three years old, probably lives more in reality than most 19, 20, and 30-year-olds in this country. Because he's learning that you can't have it all, 
He's learning that you have to make choices, that there is right and wrong, and that you'll suffer consequences. Well, why do you laugh, Andrew? No, it's just good. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard reality. It, the scary part is that most of the people your age don't even know that, you know? Right? Yeah. So these are, this is what Jesus presents to us. This is your Sunday meetings. People get possessed. You got to live your life accordingly. Now, again, the best way to prevent, I, I mean, I hate to say this, but I'm 41 years old. Not that I hate to give my age, but. Uh, I have not been possessed, and why have I not been possessed is because my mom had me baptized as a baby, uh, prayed, went to Mass. My mom and dad have gone to daily Mass for probably 40 years, you know? And on top of that, had us, you know, I, I wasn't an adult without confirmation. My parents had us confirmed at the very earliest age. We did our first communions at the very earliest age. In my family, you don't live with somebody before you get married. You have to get married, otherwise, like, everybody disowns you. Um, so, you know, my mom was very clear about that, you know, very clear about those, that, that reality. So, what's happened with that is, you know, this, my soul has always been in a state of grace. Not always, I mean, I've committed moral sins, I've done a lot of bad things, that's not. But the reality is to go to confession, to stay close to God. Yeah. Uh, when is the devil, like, when they get possessed, like, what is because you're, like, messing with you're not supposed to. So that's the easiest way, yeah. So that's the easiest way for a devil to possess you. Um, you know, believe in fortune telling, go to a fortune teller. Tarot card. Uh, yeah, do, what is it? What's that? Tarot card reading. Yeah, the tarot card readings, uh, fortune telling, um, Ouija boards. They sell my toys at rest, don't ever buy them. It sounds ridiculous, but that is probably like. That, the Ouija board that produced, it, it's such a toy. I think the devil has caused so much, caused so much more damage, and it's so weird because you walk in Toys R Us and there it is. Yeah, it's it just, there. It's so crazy how how much the devil has entered into people's house because of this little toy, and it's not a little, and it's dangerous. So, anyways, yes, you're right. So that's how the devil most likely would possess somebody. Here's who the devil doesn't want to possess. The devil doesn't want to possess most of the people you know. He already has them. He already has them. Your friends who aren't going to mass, your friends who are having promiscuous relationships, your friends who are having drugs and abusing alcohol, your friends who are living in relationships they shouldn't be living in, living lives that they shouldn't be doing. I mean, does the, the devil want to... The devil doesn't even need a... He just leaves that person alone. There's no need to tempt that person. There's a great book by an English scholar, C.S. Lewis. I love it. It's such a great read. They've adopted it into a play. If you ever get a chance to see the play, see it. It's good. But if you get it, you know, there are these certain books that you can read. It's 100 pages. You can read it in one sitting. The Screw Tape Letters. Has anybody read it? You've read it, yeah. Such a great read, right? It's so good. It's two letters. It's corresponding letters between a lower demon and a higher demon. And so you, the guy who wrote it was a devout Protestant, devout Christian, an Anglican. They said had he lived an extra year, he probably would have been Catholic. Uh, but he didn't, so, you know. But he was friends with very intellectual Catholic giants. Uh, anyways, so you're seeing this dialogue take place between one demon and another demon about this individual and how they want to get him. You know, it's such a great read. Highly recommend it. So, confirmation. Now we're moving on. Baptism, confirmation. I introduced confirmation last week. And remember, we talked about confirmation. And Doug, I'm sorry, I hate to do this to you, Doug, but can you grab my... Oh, actually, can you grab my catechism in the back of my truck? Sure. Thank you, sorry. One thing you said we should talk about is, uh, is how the devil gets to you with your music. Oh! Oh. Because a lot of trap music and a lot of house music nowadays is like is a gateway to that stuff. But anyway, I wanted to... It's just like we talk about it a lot, so... Yeah, well, it's really good. in my experience, you can buy it with... Uh... What do you mean the catechism? Yeah, it's somewhere in the thing. It's just like... And the compendium. It really stirs up, um, like, epic, uh, I guess, like, emotions and, and uh, of a certain type that if you let it ride for a long time, it can go down those alleys. Yeah. Um, I would say I still enjoy certain types of, like, deep house music, tropical house music. <laughs> but overall, there's, like, uh, there's certain types that um, I think you should just be conscious of. It can uh, make you more, like, it can... Like, it can leave you open to the devil. Yeah. Yeah, to the devil playing... On your emotions, playing on, like he said, those trances that you get into. 
Now this all sounds, this is the point where my audience looks at me and thinks like, okay, this guy's crazy. <laughs> but it is true. If you ever have the chance to hear, you can hear ex-Satanists and ex-Satanic cult worshippers, and they'll tell you about the things that they do, and the things that are out there that trap people in. Uh, so, you're right, music, a lot of the heavy, heavy metal stuff, it's not very popular nowadays anymore, but it used to be very popular in the 80s, had that same kind of effect. It really had no rhyme or reason to it, but it was just this kind of and constant noise. And a lot of the lyrics are all about like how another person is going to take you to your ultimate level of satisfaction, and there's like nothing further than the truth after, like, philosophically and experientially, that... Um, no other person will like really fulfill you that much. Now I don't know what you guys I don't know, I mean, you know I you know, the Beatles and I, I do I do very probably what you guys would consider cheesy music nowadays. Uh, if I even do music, again, if I even do music, because I don't do music. Um, but yeah, that's true. That is that is very, very true. Being selective with what we hear in music. For a lot of you young people, I got for uh, I grew up with a lot of rap music in the environment, and rap music uh, has, you know, in and of itself, it, it doesn't really elevate the soul and the mind to something better, right? Some rap music can have nice stories. Uh, Will Smith, Summertime, I think that's a great song. Uh, so it's not like I'm condemning all rap music, but I grew up where a lot of people listen to rap music that was very violent and vulgar. And so what does that do? It makes a person who listens to that a lot short-tempered, always angry, always upset, and always in a rage. And that's what the devil wants. That's what the devil, the devil is hate. So he wants to hate as much as possible to hate. Um, I was hearing a story today about a young lady on the metro train or metro rail link. I don't know if anybody heard this. But apparently she was like putting her feet on the seats and doing, just sitting in a way that's, you know, you're not supposed to put your seat down there. To see for other people to say. And there was a police officer who questioned her. I didn't hear the whole thing. But the, the girl just went on this anger towards the cop. And I have a ride, I pay for my ticket, and I'm just thinking to myself, like, if that were my kid to talk back to a police officer? Like, but yet, so entitled, right, that she just started. And the guy, the CEO for the LA Metro, whatever it is, apologized oh, for the cop. And I'm just like, did that just really happen? This is your question. And I'm sure that 20-year-old girl, 21-year-old girl, went home, and mom probably said, oh, wow, well, I'm sorry you had to go through that. That cop should have never done that. But what, what does all this, right? Our environment, our culture, and then the music that, you know, why was she so angry, so entitled? Anyways, I tried to tie in. That was what I was hearing on the way over here on the radio, so. These examples are not pre written So the catechism, confirmation, so baptism. In baptism, we talk about the necessity of baptism, that you have to be baptized. Okay? So right now, if Eddie were to leave this class and just stop coming, knowing the necessity of baptism, then he puts his soul at risk. Because the catechism of the Catholic Church says, for those who have the opportunity to have heard, to have understood, and who know that baptism is necessary for salvation, then they are bound to that. They are bound to it. Now, confirmation, and I know I closed off last week by reading this, but in 1285, and again, two of my favorite passages with regards to these two sacraments, confirmation and baptism, is baptism 1257, and then confirmation 1285. Uh, they're kind of like cornerstone readings. So, Confirmation. So baptism, the Eucharist, and the sacrament of confirmation together constitute the sacraments of Christian initiation. So what initiates you into the family? These three sacraments. Whose unity must be safeguarded. So these are always, the unity of these sacraments must be safeguarded. This is why in the Eastern rites, when babies are baptized, they're baptized, confirmed, and receive communion. All in one place. <coughs> I know it's pretty cool. You can tell I'm very biased. Right? Oh, I wish I could have had that. But, um, it must be explained to the faithful that the reception of the sacrament of confirmation is necessary for the completion of baptismal grace. So it's necessary for you to get confirmed. 
For by the sacrament of confirmation, the baptized, those of you who are baptized, are more perfectly bound to the church. So you're, you're closer to the church. You're more perfectly, I love the language, I explained that last week, more perfectly bound. Right? My wife said, you can't say more perfectly. I said, the church says it. Right? She was trying to correct my grandma. It's taken out of the post. It's the way it works. So more perfectly bound with the church and are enriched with the special strength of the Holy Spirit. Special graces, special strengths. Okay? Hence, therefore, because you have this, they are true witnesses. Another word for witness is martyr. You know what a martyr is, right? Somebody who dies, right, for the truth. Oh, I like that. Yeah. That's another word for witness is martyr. So you become a true witness. Which means now you have to die for the sake of, you know, not being cool to your kids or not being cool to your friends. You got to die to yourself and die to that desire to always want to be the individual whom everybody likes. Because why do you have to die to that desire? Because now you're a person who has to be a true witness to Jesus Christ in this gospel. It's hard. It's hard for those of you who have started walking the path of Jesus Christ. People like Andrew, people like Yusuf. Um, you know, some of you, uh, I know for Nick and you guys, I, probably life has changed, yes, a little bit? Yeah. You're already beginning to feel the effects of, like, hey, if I take this here, we're going to go down this path and, you know, be ready. Okay. So, hence, they are true witnesses, martyrs of Christ. They are more strictly obligated to spread and defend the faith by word and deed. You have an obligation, a responsibility, a duty. To fail at this means to suffer, like I tell my three-year-old. To not do it is to suffer consequences. Consequences. These are consequences. Um, part of what brings me here is it's, I, I sense, it's, it's a sense of duty, an obligation to spread and defend the faith. And what do I defend the faith? Not you guys who are attacking the faith. But the people you're, you see, I'm defending the faith to try to undo the individuals, professors, teachers, friends you've ran into who've given you so much garbage throughout those years that now I have to defend the Catholic faith to undo a lot of that. I'm hoping you're beginning to see, like, you guys, you're, who's, you're, who's in UCI? UCI, where do you go to school? Santa Ana College. Santa College, where do you go to school? Okay, so you understand what I'm talking about. Yes, you're seeing this kind of, like, belittling of Christianity, belittling of morality, belittling of right and wrong at school. Right? Yeah. Everybody's a bad guy. Anybody who wants to say anything wrong. Um, you know, just the whole entitlement, the idea that, that everybody should have whatever they want. You're, you're seeing that. So, we're more obligated to defend the faith. I'm trying to undo, not everything, obviously one plus one is still do. I don't want to undo the math here. So that's the responsibility. It's a great, great, great obligation, a great, great, great responsibility. Necessary. Confirmation is necessary. And it gives you strength. It gives you strength to, to live out the Christian virtues. So like I tell myself, what are the three theological virtues? Faith, hope, and charity. And what are the four cardinal virtues? I mean, always get stuck, so we have to go through it, right? Prudence, temperance, justice, and fortitude. These are the things that that you need grace in order to... What does it mean to be prudent? It means not just simply to do the right thing, but to do the right thing at the right time. You need to be prudent. Like, you know, who you're talking to, and is this the right time to say it? Right? Prudence. Temperance. To temper your desires. Yes, you would love to have that fourth beer. But maybe you should. Right? You'd love to have that extra piece of cake. And what does that temperance do? It helps you control your will to make decisions. Why? Seems big, seems small. An extra piece of cake, an extra, but a married man and a woman approaches him and she throws herself at him because he has conditioned the will, tempered himself and other things, he will be able to say, this really means something. I got somebody at home. Paul Newman said, why go out for hamburgers when you have steak at home? That was a famous quote about his wife. I kind of like temperance. <laughs> <laughs> so you got temperance. You have justice. So justice is now to do what is right, always. And to give somebody what they rightly deserve. Yes? Um, I don't know if this is outside, but the 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me come back to that. Then let me come back to that. So did somebody remind me to read the first for this coming? Of uh, not last week, this week. This coming. Okay, so, so remind me one of you two, okay, so I can read it. I'll do commentary before class. Because I have the missile for it and it, it kind of explains how many people see things of the world while single people only see Oh okay, I know what you're talking about. So I'll tell you why he says that and I'll tell you in the context of what he says. Okay. So so justice is to do what is right to give somebody their right, like what they rightfully deserve, right? So somebody's position offers uh, the queen, the queen of England, right? You do, when you, how do you treat her? You, you treat her according to her office. So justice is to give somebody what they deserve according to who they are. You don't give God what your, you don't treat God the way you would treat your brothers and sisters. Because justice demands that you treat that what is given to him is more. So that you do right or wrong. And then fortitude, courage. Courage, strength. So the Holy Spirit, confirmation, gives you these things, plus the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we'll talk about in a minute. So, strengthens us. Now, confirmation in the Bible. We did baptism in the Bible. Here's confirmation in the Bible. Open up to Acts 19. So, this is in the New Testament, Acts 19. I'm getting a pen because, like I said, my old Bible had a lot. This, these are the verses I used to mark. And this is a good one. Acts 19, and the verse is 1 through 7. So Acts 19, 1 through 7, I'm going to read. Now it says this, Acts 19, 1-7, Paul in Ephesus, you see that there. He says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you, were, when you believed? And they said, no, you have never heard of this, that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? Notice, Notice he's making a distinction. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? No, we haven't. Then how were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. So at that time, John the Baptist was still, you know, he had baptized, but he was already dead. So there were still Jews doing that. And Paul said, John's baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. So John's baptism was to get ready for Jesus. Jesus is here. John's baptism is no good. That's... Don't do that. It's a waste of time. Five. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. So this doesn't mean that they were baptized, I baptize you in the name of Jesus. It means that they were baptized how Jesus wanted people to be baptized. Right? And Jesus is the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Verse six. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. There were about 12 of them in all. So, we see here, they were baptized, and then he laid his hands. So, here's baptism. Baptism is getting water, pouring it over the baby, or the individual. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here's confirmation. The bishop, or a priest delegated by the bishop, lays his hands on you, and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Right? So, two different actions. Baptism first, and then this. Now, let's go to Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter 8. So remember, they received a new baptism, and then Paul lays the hands. So this, this laying of the hands, that's another term for confirmation. Acts 8, 14 to 17. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. 
For the Spirit had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So, here, now Acts is clear. Right? The apostles are sent to a place where it's already been preached. The gospel's already been preached. We already know they've been baptized. Now, when you're baptized, do you receive the Holy Spirit? Yes, you receive the Holy Spirit when you're baptized. The distinction here, remember the early church didn't have all these words and distinctions. We make the distinctions now so that we can better understand it. But notice, the distinction's already being made by, yes, they've been baptized, and then it's have they received the Holy Spirit. So, if you were living at that time, you would understand this. We've been baptized, we've received the Holy Spirit at baptism, but have we received the gifts of the Holy Spirit? That's how you would kind of understand it. The laying on the hands. Yes? What was the verse of that? Oh, 8, 14 to 16. 14 to 17. 8, 14 to 17. So, they've been baptized, and then you see the laying of the hands to receive the Holy Spirit. So, confirmation, people say, well, that's not in the Bible, and where is it in the Bible? Yet there it is. It's, it's in the Bible. Now, a couple of other passages to kind of go through confirmation before we jump to the Eucharist. And I will give you something in the Old Testament. Although in the Old Testament, you know, baptism, we can, we can tie to circumcision. But we can't do that with confirmation. But I'm, I'm going to show you the idea of anointing in the Old Testament and what that means. So a couple of verses here about being sealed with the Spirit, 2 Corinthians. Now I'm not saying these, these next verses, I'm not saying that they're specifically about confirmation. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just giving you some theology about confirmation. And what does it mean? So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 to 22. But it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has commissioned us. He has put his seal upon us and given of his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. In confirmation, there's a seal on your soul and a guarantee, strength, he will always be with you. In Ephesians, so again, in the New Testament, and did you end up getting, you didn't end up getting Bible tests, so. I did. Oh, you did? I did not Oh, okay. So here's something Eddie did, and I, and I do think it's pretty neat. Actually, I'll probably, I'll look through my stuff. One, he went out and got the Bible, which, again, you know, this leather bound, this will last him his, his entire life. And then two, he got these tabs. Now, how much were the tabs, for like four bucks or five, five bucks? The tabs make you easy to see, like, the books. So David uses, a lot of people I know use tabs. A lot of people I know use tabs. Uh, I should have to. You have tabs there, too, right? Yeah. So the tabs are really, really neat to get you through stuff. Um, so, you know, just, that's a plug. I don't, obviously, I don't make loyalty on selling Bible tabs. <laughs> I don't make loyalty on any <laughs> Yeah. So when you're reading, like, these verses, mm -hmm. Are you paraphrasing, or are you reading it word for word? I'm reading it word for word. Because it doesn't match. Like, what okay, the right. So, when it doesn't match, here's why it doesn't match. Now, I am not a Greek and a Hebrew scholar. My degree is in biblical theology. So, if I were to ever get a PhD, I'd have to study Greek or Hebrew. One of the, at least one of the two. Here's why it doesn't match, though. Is in the Hebrew, or in the Greek, the statement is made... But how you translate it could be several ways. Some things cannot be translated literally in order to convey the message. Another reason is some Bibles do translations that are a little bit more modern and easier for the, read, the person to read. However, the Bible that I'm giving you, I would never give a Bible that I didn't think was good, meaning as far as translation goes. Uh, so the Bible probably is a little bit newer than my translation, but it still should be pretty close. Yeah, you should still... So that's, if ever there's a discrepancy that seems big, raise a hand and let me know. Yes? I think one thing that was helpful for me to understand that was like, like there's some words in English that just don't translate in Spanish, and some words in Spanish just don't translate in English. Yeah. And so like when they translate the Greek of Hebrew to the English, there's like, you actually have a choice in whether you want to convey the meaning of the word or the actual word. And then sometimes the meaning is lost with the actual word. So like, that's why there's... So some people prefer to do, like, translate the meaning, or some people prefer to translate the actual word. And then it, the meaning sometimes 
No. And he's just putting them into two categories. When you actually translate ancient yeah. languages, there's a lot more than just that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's a great. Um, there was a Bud. Light, this, this is being recorded. Um, but there was a Bud Light commercial, and I think it was the, the guys were like. Uh, anyways, they used the, the term "way," right? Like, like. Does anybody remember that Bud Light commercial? Not the Dilly Dilly. No, not the Dilly Dilly. <laughs> this is like six. It ran for a very short time because it was an English commercial broadcast in English channels. But they realize that, you know, like, you know, somebody says, hey, wait, vamos para acá, right? <laughs> but that's kind of like a derogatory term, right? Which is kind of okay amongst friends, but not okay in a general setting for a mass audience. And so they pulled the commercial right away because they realized, well, this doesn't translate really well to an English market. And, you know, so, you know, basically, you have those, what he's saying, right? It was a white guy with the next Right. And so that's another reason, right? So you had a, you can YouTube it. It's probably like, it's about five, six years ago. Uh, Ephesians. So, Bible text, Ephesians, translations. Uh, do I prefer my translate? I, I don't, there's another Bible that my, most of my teachers use a different Bible than the one I'm using, but I do like this one. Just, uh, it's proven to be pretty good for my studies. <clears throat> Uh, really short. Yeah, yeah, a lot of the letters are pretty short. Yeah. The longest being like Romans and Hebrews. Those would be the longest letters. Of course, Acts is not a letter. So. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 to 14. Verse 11 to 14. I'm going to start at verse 7. Uh, just because I have it on my notes, it's going to start at verse 7. It says this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. Look at that. Forgiveness of our sins, redemption, lavishing his grace. Verse 9. For he has made known to us in all wisdom and insight, the mysteries of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So this idea that every individual knows what they should do because God has already told you, and how has he told you in Christ? No one has an excuse. Now verse 11. In him, according to the purpose of him, who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will, we who first hoped in Christ have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed him, you've heard it, you believed it, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession, possession of it in the praise of his glory. You, I could live, you know, I live a pretty good life. I'm always pretty happy. I have a confidence in the fact that I'm going to have it. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. But verses like this, look at the confidence of this, right? That you, you, you believed in it, you were sealed in it, and you can have you get the guarantee of our inheritance. But, not until when? Until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So Paul, if you read Romans, if you understand Paul, Paul says this, yes, Yes, salvation is yours. Yes, it's not. But you've got to persevere in it. So you can live with the hope that you're going to have it. People who don't are people who commit a lot of moral sins. They don't sleep good at night. They, you know, they got certain neuroses. It's just, it's just true. It's true. Right? The biggest growing trend in the past 40 years has been like psychology, counseling, and therapy, right? To get rid of a bunch of these neuroses. When in reality... All these people had to do is go to confession on a, month, on a once a month basis. We would put an industry, we would cut it in half if individuals became Christian and went to confession once a month. Now I feel bad for those people who are making money on therapy, counseling, and psychiatry, right? But, I mean, just, just think of your own certain life when individuals do something that's bad, when you, when you do something that's bad. You can't sleep at night, you feel guilty. You know, you don't, 
But when everything's right, when everything's right with you and your wife, when everything's right with you and your husband, when you're honest at work, when you're just, you, you, you go about your life. You don't really, everything's fine. You know, like, so anyways, Paul presents to us this great image of being sealed with the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 6, 1 to 4. So this is a lot of the, and there's a, I got a lot of verses with confirmation. Hebrews chapter 6, 1 to 4. This is another Bible study that maybe next year I'll do. I just did Romans, so I wouldn't want to do Hebrews anything. Hebrews 6, 1 through 4. This is pretty good. So, here's what Paul says in Hebrews 6. What, what's the page of the Bible if you found it? 335. 335. Okay, good. You guys all have the same Bible, so if you're wondering, maybe I have to trans. I, I'm just not going to transition over to that Bible. The reason is, is I got then I would have different Bibles, one for school, one for work. Sorry. But as long as my audience has it and you guys are flipping through it, then. so don't look at me, but like, why don't you just see all the pages? <laughs> Hebrews 6, uh, 1 to 4, he says this. Therefore, let us leave elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity. So you and I, we're like not even elementary. We're like pre-K. <laughs> Like, that's what I do in this class, like pre-K, okay? Maybe some elementary. Now, look at what Paul's saying. Paul says, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. So he's saying, we're going beyond the basics now. Now you're talking about the spiritual life, uh, you know, just theology, the depths of God, mysteries, you know, the things people ponder. So, with faith towards God, verse 2, with instructions about baptism, laying on of the hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And, and this we will do if God permits, for it is impossible to restore again the repentance. So, he's saying this, let's put aside all this stuff, and in that, he takes about baptism and the laying on of the hands. He distinguishes the two. So now, if somebody asks you, why do you believe in confirmation, you can take them to Acts 19, Acts 8, and you can take them to Hebrews 1, 6, and say, obviously, Paul, and in Acts 8, Luke, the author of Luke, but Paul said it in Acts 19, obviously, Paul and Luke <coughs> separate the two, so therefore, they believe the two are two different sacraments. Luke 12, the Gospel of Luke. Now, again, does Jesus say anything specifically about confirmation? No, he does not. He does not. But does the Bible? Yes. So, here's what we can assume. Jesus taught it, the apostles knew it, and therefore the apostles taught it. How do we know that? Because John says at the end of his gospel, not everything Jesus said and did is recorded in the Bible. Okay, so, uh, Luke 12, 11 to 12, says the following. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how or what you are to answer or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you are to say. So the Holy Spirit will strengthen us, will help us, will guide us. Jesus says this. I don't know how many times. Here's what I've done when I've gone and found myself in situations where I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do. Come Holy Spirit, help me. That's it. I don't even pray the whole come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit for the house of that one kid on the entire show. I just say, come Holy Spirit, help me. Again, I told you I've been in various debates, various sidewalk counseling times. There was that time that I told you about before where I was door to door knocking and I ran across the individual and he wanted to go through the saints in his Bible. He handed me his Spanish Bible. I don't even speak Spanish that well. Okay? He handed me his Spanish Bible, his Protestant translation, his Protestant Bible. I want you to use my Bible. I am not, like, spitting out verses. I'm, that's not my thing. I just, it's never been. I, I like to read in big chunks and not memorize a bunch of little slice and dice verses, although that is important. Well, there I am. I don't have my notes. I had my Bible, but I didn't have my notes in my Bible. And he just handed me his. And I just remember just looking down and saying, you know, come Holy Spirit, help me. I said a small little quick prayer and just started opening the Bible. I said, well, let me get you here. I got to... 
Revelations 5 and 6 and 8, then I took him to, to, to uh, Matthew, and then I took him to all these places. Three hours, two and a half hours, the conversation went back and forth. And at the end of the day, he was like, he, again, I think I said this before, he used to be Catholic, left the church, and that's when I left him with, like, all I want you to do is to say that now you understand why I pray to saints, why Catholics pray to saints. And he's all like, well, if I understand that, you're going to say I believe. And I said, no, no, believe. that's your business, whether you believe or not. Now you understand why I do what I do, and why the Virgen de Guadalupe is not this horrible thing that you started off by saying it was. And he said, yeah, I get it. He goes, but when I was Catholic, nobody did what you just did. And I said, I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry how you did that. And of course, I told you the story. It was 105 degrees. He invited me into his house. He didn't pull up. And then we started talking about Jehovah's Witness. Not bad, but because they were door knocking and a lot of people were converting Jehovah's Witness, and he was like, you know, this is this is a problem. You know? I'm like, yeah. So now you have a Protestant who used to be a Catholic, became a Protestant, but he's a Christian, still believes Jesus is true God and true man. And now he sees the fact that a lot of Mexicans, this was his thing, that they don't know Christianity that well, so they're leaving Jehovah's Witness. And I'm looking at him, and I'm like, oh, so you understand my problem? You used to be Catholic, you left because you didn't know your faith, and now you're worried that everybody's going to leave to Jehovah's Witness. So if you don't know our faith, we're going to leave. The next salesperson who comes knocking at your door, you're going to leave. Right? Hispanics in Miami, Florida, there was a study, Hispanic women were converting to the Nation of Islam at a faster rate than any other religion. Really? In Miami, in Florida. You want to know the reasons that they gave, the women gave? Because it was strict, because they had to be veiled and moderately dressed, which means, or they took it to mean like, you know, it respected women more. Islam does or not, I don't you to be the judge of that. But in reality, the Catholic Church already has teachings about modesty, teachings about how we should dress, how we should behave. You know, if you want to cover your head at Mass, do it. My wife does, my daughter will. You know, we're a veil. You know? She, all those things she mentioned, she had in the Catholic Church, but they left. So, somebody's going to knock on our door and we're going to leave. So, confirmation. Another word for confirmation is chrismation. Chrism after the oil. Now, this is the East, they call it chrismation. The oil that's used is what we call chrism oil. Right? The word chrism comes from the same word as Christ, which means anointing. So, the Christos is the Greek word for the Messiah in Hebrew. And what do those two mean? Anointing. So, you're the anointed one. When you are confirmed, you are anointed. And how are you anointed? In the same way that Jesus was anointed. Meaning, when, the, when God looks upon you, He says, Behold my beloved son, and with whom I am well pleased. Behold my beloved daughter, and whom I am well pleased. In confirmation, we receive the fullness of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, I am going to take you to the Old Testament. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel. Two eighty six in the Old Testament. So First Samuel chapter ten. I'm going to read verse one to nine. I want you to focus on verse one, six, and nine. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail here, but Saul is chosen to be king. This is Saul. First Samuel. First Samuel. Oh, sorry. First Samuel chapter ten. Did I say chapter nine or chapter ten? Chapter ten, one through nine. Chapter 10 begins, now, here it says, okay. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it into his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over the people of Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you shall save them from the hands of their enemies round about. And this shall be a sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. So you see that anointing, kingly anointing. When you depart from me today, you will meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzal. And they will say to you, the donkeys which you, which you went to seek are found. And now your father has ceased to care about the donkeys and is anxious about you saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you shall go from there further and come to an oak of Tabor. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there, one carrying three kids another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall accept from their hand. After that, you shall come to Gebethohen, where there is a garrison of Philistines. And there 
as you come to the city, you will meet a band of prophets coming down from the high place with harps, tambourines, flutes, a lyre before prophesying. Before them prophesying. So, what is he going to do, Saul the king? He's a prince. He's going to prophesy. Now, prophesy does not mean to call the future. Right? It means to convey God's message. Like it's a seer. It's to convey God's message. So that was it. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come mightily upon you, and you shall prophesy with them, and be turned into another man. So notice this idea of being turned into another man, priest, prophet. When these things, when these signs meet you, do whatever your hand finds you to do, for God is with you. And you shall go down before me to Gilgal. Behold, I am coming to you to offer burnt offerings and the sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. Verse 9, when he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all these signs came to pass that day. Remember, the animals, what were the animals for? <clears throat> Sacrifice. And who sacrifices? Priest. Priest, prophet, and king. The kings, when they were anointed, Saul, David, Solomon, when they were anointed, they were anointed as priests, prophets, and kings. At your baptism, at your confirmation, you will be anointed a priest, a prophet, a king. A priest, a successor of prior kings, especially Jesus Christ. Right? A, a prophet to continue the message of Jesus Christ. And what's, what's his mission statement? Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's his mission. That's Jesus. If you want a mission statement, Mark 1.15. A priest, prophet, and king. Right? Sit on a throne. And what's Jesus' throne? The cross. What is any, any good king that you've ever read about in history, what does that king do? He serves his people. He lives for his people. Think about the... I mean, this is why history is important. King Louis of France. Such a great king. This guy went out to war with his army, and he was in the front. And he always wanted to give his people the best. He lived amongst his soldiers. I mean, he always saw his life in service to his people in France. That's why he's a saint. Any great king. You see the movie Braveheart, right? They want to make him king, right? But he kind of denies it. He doesn't want it, and obviously he dies before it even gets to that point. But the guy who does become king is the guy who betrayed right, William Wallace, right? But then he realizes that I had to be like him. So therefore he goes out and begins to serve the people. That's what a king does, okay? So, these are the things. Now, another na other names for confirmation, the laying on the hands, the seal of the Lord, the staff of the Lord. The liturgy of confirmation. So the liturgy of baptism is, is the matter and the form. The matter is what matters, right? You know, matter, science, and you have or something physical, the matter of the form. So the matter is the laying on the hands. Right? The oil and the laying on the hands. You have to have the oil and the laying on the hands. You have to have the laying on the hands. That's essential for confirmation. And the form is the bishop or a priest delegated by the bishop saying, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's it. Right? This is, so this is the liturgy as to how it's done. You have to have the correct intention so belief in Christ and all the things of Jesus Christ in His church. So you have to want to do it. The matter, you have to have the oil. What does the oil have to be? It can't be like, you know, don't go get oil from your house. Okay, we'll get corn oil, or vegetable oil. <laughs> it's literally a specific oil. It has to be made, right, of, of olives and balm. It's just, that's why it smells. It smells really good. If you've been a, when you get confirmed, you know, go ahead and smell it. It smells really, really good. Uh, it's got to be blessed by the bishop on Holy Thursday or on any other day. It's got to be blessed by the bishop. But the laying on the hands to be confirmed, making the sign of the cross with the forehead, right? Being sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. That It has to be done that way, otherwise it's, it's not. So every sacrament has its matter and form. Every sacrament has its matter and form. So that's confirmation. Now, we're moving on. This next topic is going to take us a good... Four days. Next week, I'm going to talk about Lent. So don't be here for Lent, because then once a year, I get a bunch of texts and emails about, can I eat chicken? 
what, what does it mean to fast? You know, and I'm, off, I'm often answering all these things. Uh, here are the notes. These are the notes. We have these up for me. Here the end. So there you go. Should make a quick, a Victor's quick reference to that online. I know. To, to, to. Uh, but confirmation, I mean, Lent, and that's, I'm going to go, it's a really big, it's a, it's a lot of notes. It's the same amount of notes as this, but we're only gonna, I'm only going to do it in one day. I'm not going to do it in two. So we're going to read through it really quick. But right now, what I want to do is start the Eucharist. Now, this is it. This is like in the middle of the series falls this class. Because the church calls the Eucharist the source and summit of your life. The most important thing, I mean, not thing, but the most important aspect of your life you will ever do, the most important, I mean, it's the Eucharist. The Eucharist. Why? Because the Eucharist is Jesus. The source and summit. What, the way the church talks about the Eucharist is like, it, it is, it's like air. It's like you can't live without it. It's the most important thing to your existence is oxygen. You don't think about it, but it's the most important thing. Without it, you just, you don't exist. So that's the Eucharist. Now, in these statistics, when I'm going to start, you're going to see yourself in it. And I'm sorry, this class isn't for me to point the finger at you. This is the class for me to point the finger at you and me, and the entire institution that is the Catholic Church. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, look at these statistics. In 1992, a Gallup poll found that the majority of Catholics are confused in their beliefs about Christ's presence in the Eucharist. Nearly 70% of Catholics in this country hold erroneous beliefs about Christ's presence in the Eucharist. 29% say it symbolizes the body and blood of Christ. 10% believe they receive bread and wine and Jesus, consubstantiation, the Luther position. 24% say it changes only because of their own personal beliefs. Only about 30% believe that they really and truly receive the body, blood, soul, and dignity of Jesus Christ. That's a 1992 study. In 1994, a New York Times CBS news poll concluded that only 34% of Catholics in the U.S. believe that in the Mass, the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. While 63% said that the bread and wine are merely symbolic reminders of Jesus. A 1999 study produced similar results. There was a priest one time who came to give a retreat. He was gonna, he was here during the week. He was gonna celebrate Mass after. He was gonna do a talk after the Mass. He didn't believe me. These notes. He didn't believe these notes. I said, "No." Nah. I said, "Why don't you, during your talk, ask the audience? Probably about two thousand people, our leader Guadalupe, Hispanic, all Spanish people. Why don't you ask them how many of them believe that the Eucharist is only a symbol of Jesus Christ?" I said, ask. And then you can see. He asked the question, and all the hands went up. Oh my God. I mean, all the hands went up. Now, you could have said, well, they didn't really understand his questions. But he asked the question pretty well. I mean, he asked it pretty simple. You know, do you, how many of you believe that the Eucharist, that what we do in Mass, is only symbolic? It's only a symbol. So he was pretty clear. And all the hands went up. I was sitting in the back. I just went. He just couldn't believe it. 2010, a Pew Forum, a U.S. Religious Knowledge Survey, found the following. Now this, I think you can still take 15 questions online. They still have 15 sample questions. I've taken it. I think I have a copy of the one I took. It asks you different questions. It's not just about Catholicism. About half of those polled, Catholics and non-Catholics, 52%, say incorrectly that Catholicism teaches that the bread and wine used for communion are symbols of the body and blood of Jesus. Now, you might be saying, well, that's great, because now it's 50%. Here's the problem. The question only gives you two options. So if you look at the question, it gives you the question, and then you only have A and B to choose. So really, it's, it's a coin flip on whether you're going to get it right or not. So like I said, you could probably hop online and still get this question. Just four in ten people correctly answered, according to the Catholic Church, the bread and wine actually becomes the body and blood of Jesus. Even many Catholics aren't aware of the Church's teaching on this topic. While 55% of the Catholics get the question right, more than 4 in 10 Catholics, 41%, say the Church teaches that the bread and wine are symbols of Christ. And 3% say they don't know what the Church teaches is. So I guess that was the third option. I don't remember that. Still, Catholics perform better on this question 
than do many other religious groups. Okay, so of course, uh, you would hope so. But here's where we're at. What, what's the number like today? I would say it's probably still the same. How do I know that? Because if I were to do the same question, and this is probably what I should do, I should do a questionnaire before class. Right? How many of you think, honestly, how many of you think you would have gotten it right? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you think you would have gotten it right. Okay, so, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I don't even call you, I won't count you, so. So I'll even count her. She's in the neocab, but she's still here for this class. So one, two, three, four. I would say that at the beginning of the class, when the, you know, when it's full, there's about 40, 35 people here. That's even less than 30%. And that's probably more indicative of our friends, our families, and the people around us. So, what do we believe? Jesus' presence. Now, there are three ways by which Jesus can be present. He is present everywhere, because he's God. This is what we call the omnipresence. There's no place that God is not present. Omnipresence, right? God is present everywhere. He is present spiritually in those who are in a state of grace, when we receive the sacraments, when we gather in his name. So even, again, Jesus' presence is, for non-Catholic Christians, you never want to say Jesus isn't present there. You know, he's present where two or three are gathered in his name. Right? In his word. For it is he who speaks when the scriptures are read in the church. The third mode of presence, now these are what we call modes of presence, not modes of existence. Okay, modes of existence, that's modalism, that's a heresy with regards to the Trinity. But that's more complex. God bless you. He is present in his flesh, body, and blood in the Eucharist. In this sacrament, Christ is present in a unique way, whole and entire, God and man par excellence. The Church is teaching in Mysterious Feet in number 46 says, Christ is present whole and entire in his physical reality, corporally present, although not in the manner in which bodies are present. Now, think about it. Now, this is just crazy. This, this is really, really crazy. 2,000 years ago, this man Jesus walks on earth, he teaches with his apostles, he does everything, right? His followers... Believe in him. Believe in the resurrection. Meet some new peoples. Let me meet some new people. Hey, so let me tell you about this guy, Jesus. You know, he's a great guy. He did these miracles. He, was, he claimed to be God. He proved it. He rose from the dead. And you guys are like, okay, okay. You know, and, and you know, you should become, you should join us. You know, become Christian. Those who believe in Christ. We take care of the poor. We feed the hungry. You know, we, we do all these good works. This is all our teaching. Yeah, okay, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. And we eat his body and blood. You what? <laughs> you, you, wait, I'm sorry, I missed that last part. I got the part about charity, helping the poor. I got all that part. You do what? Yeah, we eat his body and blood. Yeah, I'm gone. I'm out of here. Like, it is crazy. When you think about it. But here's the reality, it is true. Again, Catholicism is, it's either true, or it's the most nutty, craziest thing. It can't be middle of the road. When you receive communion, you receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And it's a hard reality, it's a hard thing to embody, it's a hard thing to actualize. I get it. I've been Catholic for my entire life. Did my first communion at seven years old. I get it. But sometimes when I receive communion and I have holding my baby, I just I hold my son or my daughter just close and they can't receive communion. And I think to myself, God, you're physically present here. Take care of my kids. Take care of me. Take care of my wife. Take care of my family. Like to, to, to touch, and not just something to touch God, but to have him inside of you in a very real way. This is what we believe. This is what the church teaches. No other religion has this. Your, I'm sorry, your mom's religion doesn't have it. You know, your grandparents, your parents' religion doesn't, it, it doesn't have it. And yet, this is what God gave us. This is who Jesus gave us. Profound. And this is what we believe. If you do not believe this, then leave. Bye. Because to not believe this is to not be Catholic. It's, it's to not believe in the words of Jesus Christ. It means you're something else. You're not Catholic. This is essential. 
to being Catholic, to believe that in the Eucharist you receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And if any of you were to ever say this in a college class, if a professor says, well, what religion are you? You take a philosophy class. Have you taken philosophy classes? If I were teaching philosophy, I'd do a little Q&A introduction with my students, right? I'd see what religion they are. You know, you get a Hindu, you get a Buddhist, you get a Muslim. Oh, okay, can you give me some core tenets of, of your, your religion? You know, the Muslim would say, well, we believe in Muhammad and the pillar, and there is no God in the law, but Muhammad is his prophet. And the Hindu would go on about the Atma, the divine self, and the reincarnation, and the Buddha, right? The Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path. And then I would meet the Catholic. And the Catholic would say, well, we believe in Jesus Christ, that Jesus is true God and true man, that he rose from the dead, that if you were scoured the earth, you'd never find his bones, and therefore he proved who he is, and he's God. And we believe that he is with us always, most specifically in the Eucharist. And as a teacher, I said, well, what is the Eucharist? What's the body, blood, soul, and the name of Jesus Christ? And what do you do with that? Well, we consume it. And the entire class would be shocked. The professor wouldn't know what to say. But that would be a great answer. <clears throat> right? Like that's a great summary of Jesus Christ and the Eucharist at the center of our lives. Yeah? I was going to, like, because like, me and my sister, like, we're, we were born and like, we were raised in the New Testament in the world mm -hmm. as well. And so, like, we were just, like, taught knowing that. Like, just, oh, you guys are also New Testament members. Like, we okay. like, were just taught, like, growing up that there was the, blood, the body and blood of Christ. And like, how do you back that up? Like, how do you? Because like, when they ask us, like, we don't know how to explain it. It's just something we know. Okay, so that's what. We, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And that is, this entire four days are going to be to talk about it, to explain it, and for you to know it. But it is true. So the way you were raised and the way you were taught is great because that's what I'm doing with my son. At the consecration, I get my son. He's three years old, and I try to get him to pay attention when the priest lifts up the host, right? And it's pretty neat, because I go to Mass, and at the Mass I go to, the priest is faced like this, or the priest is faced like this. So, <clears throat> the way Mass should be celebrated. This, this is being recorded, yes, that's what I said. Um, but anyways, when it's celebrated like this, the priest lifts up the host, and he lifts it up to the point where everyone can see it in the back. And so I try to point it out to my son, like, that's Jesus. Or, you know, Papa, what is it? Oh, that's Jesus, Papa, that's Jesus. And that's, that's a great, you have a great understanding. Now, what does it mean and how, that's what we're going to do. But yes, we receive the body, blood, soul, and the name of Jesus Christ. Now, here's what the Catechism of the Catholic Church says. And we're going to use your compendium. So go to 271, question and answer, 271. And if you want to bring champurado or coffee or hot chocolate, since it is cold now and then you can I just ask that you don't make a mess. Hey, Jamie, well, give me a question. Read the question and answer, please. What is the Eucharist? The Eucharist is the very sacrifice of the body and blood of the Lord. Jesus, which he instituted to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross. Pause. So, key words. Sacrifice, that's what it is. Perpetuate means to continually make present. Okay, it's not a repeat, it's a represent, to to represent, perpetual. Okay, keep going. Throughout the ages, until his return in glory, thus he entrusted to his church the memorial of his death and resurrection. It is a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet, and in which Christ is consumed, the mind is filled with grace, and the pledge of future glory is given to us. Think about this. Your mind is filled with grace. Your mind is filled with grace. Here's the other thing. A pledge of future glory. A promise of heaven. Of heaven. The people who receive communion, me, you know, Yusuf, the people who receive communion, that's what they receive. It's profound. It, it completes the process of Christian initiation. This pledge of future glory. 274... Question and answer. Well, 273, do me a favor. Um, who else wants to read? Luke, go ahead. 273. Uh, how do you execute the Eucharist? After we had gathered with the apostles to each temple, Jesus took bread in his hands. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it, and this is my body, and be given up to you. Then he took the cup 
the wine in his hands and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the child's in my blood. The blood is the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So that's just straight from the Mass. Now, Luke, read 274, question and answer. Um, what does the Eucharist represent in the life of the church? It is the source and summit of all Christian life. Stop. The source and summit of all Christian life. Source means like the reason for its existence, the reason, the source, the very heart of it all, the heart of the matter, right? We want to get to the heart of the matter. Who sings that song? Someone from the Eagles. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> you can tell I listen to very old music. But it's the, it's the source, the summit is the peak. The peak, the source and summit. The church is telling us, for the Christian, for anybody, there's nothing greater that you will ever do in your life, nothing greater than receive communion. People are dying of the flu. You can cure the, the common cold. You can cure the flu. You can cure cancer. Think about that. You can cure cancer. You can cure millions of babies and adults and people dying of cancer. And it wouldn't even compare to one reception of a community. Like that's, that's it. I live for Sunday, and I live for, I, I mean, day mass, like, you know, to try to go during the week. I'm so busy right now at work, and I thought to myself, I gotta, I gotta get out. Like, you know, I gotta get out. I gotta make the mass. I get so hard sometimes. But why do I have the desire? Because this is the reason for my existence. There's nothing greater that you will do. Nothing greater that your kids will do. Nothing greater that your wife will do. It is the source and summit of our lives. That's it. Like, if we just preach this and priests would preach this, then people would realize, you can't leave the Catholic Church. I can't commit adultery. Why can I not commit adultery? Because it would be an injustice to my wife, because it would offend God. Yes, all of those things are true. Because then I wouldn't be able to receive. Then I wouldn't be able to receive God. Imagine that. I can't commit all of these mortal sins, pornography, impure thoughts, drunkenness, drugs, all of these things. Think about how we can overcome our addictions by teaching the truth of the Eucharist and then instilling within each individual a desire to want to... Because why wouldn't you want to receive heaven? Why wouldn't you want to receive the best thing? If I told you this Sunday the priest is going to give a million dollars to every person who comes up for communion... All of you would go. Not only would you go, you'd tell everyone. And yet something greater is going to happen. Something bigger is going to happen. Think about that. A million dollars pales in comparison. Take away everything, God. Take away everything I have. But just don't take away you. That's what... The, this, is, this is it. Look at how small like these words. It's just... It's almost like... Like, that's all, like, this whole section could have just been that, and it would have been theologically profound. Right? That one sentence. Keep going. Uh, in the Eucharist, the sanctifying action of God in our regard and our worship of Him reached their high point. It contains the whole spiritual good of the church. Look at that. The whole spiritual good of the church. Everything that the church gives that is good. Everything is contained in the Eucharist. Keep going. Uh, Christ Himself, our past. Our past, our Passover. So, Christ. God himself, keep going. Communion with divine life and the unity of the people of God are both expressed and affected by the Eucharist. So, not only are you in union with God, but you're in union with all the people of God. And I mean union. I mean one. This is how the Jew understood his existence. He understood his existence not in isolation, but as the people of God. And to be separated from the people means to be dead. Old Te this is why I love the Old Testament. I love my academic Old Testament studies. It's allowed me to understand so much. Keep going. Through the Eucharistic celebration, we are united already in the energy of heaven and the foretaste of life. You're united to heaven, and it is a foretaste of heaven. Who doesn't want heaven? Like, who doesn't want heaven? I promised you one time, and I rarely share these things. I rarely share them publicly. But I was at Mass one time. And I know, I remember where I was sitting, I remember the Mass I was at, and the hymnal, it was, it was the Latin Mass, and the hymnal began to sing, 
the, the entrance song. And I remember closing my eyes. And, you know, normally I close my eyes because if I'm not wearing my glasses, then I get headed. But I remember closing my eyes and praying, and the Mass was about to start really, you know, just there, President Mass. And I guarantee you not, I felt and saw, like, the presence of all the angels in angelic glory. It was so overwhelming, I had to kind of almost slap myself out of it because I thought I was just going to break down in tears. I literally had tears come down. It was... I, it only, it's only happened to me maybe like twice. And now this one time that I can remember, it was such a reality that now when I teach this, this foretaste of heaven, this heaven on earth, I think maybe God allowed me to experience witness or somehow just so that when I convey it to you, and I'm not, you know, I'm not one here to just, the teacher doesn't tell you this and lie about it to try to get you pumped up about the Eucharist or something like that. It's somehow I, I experienced this and I kind of feel bad because I really cut it short. I really woke myself out of it because I didn't want to be a distraction at Mass, right? Uh, but the, pro the fact of the matter is I'll never forget it. And anyways, heaven on earth. It really is heaven on earth. There's a movie called, that you should all rent, you should all watch with your kids. It's called El Gran Milagro, The Greatest Miracle. If you have not seen have you guys seen it back then? Yeah, it's, it's really cool. And it's, it's even cool, like, when, how old were you when you saw it? Like, how many years ago? A couple of years ago, so they were still teenagers. When you saw it, did you like it? Like, it wasn't boring, right? I mean, it's a little cheesy, but it's, it's, it's not like, you know, it's not like really low production. It was really good. Have you seen it? No, you gotta watch it. Anyways, when you see this, you get this, you get this, it's a whole mass present from beginning to end. Have you seen that, Adam? You have not seen it, The Greatest Miracle? No. Oh, but uh, uh, I could um, share, like, attending <clears throat> Mass. It was summer, it was so hot, at Holy Family. And during the Gloria, I heard the angels singing along with the people. It was so heavenly. I was just, oh my God, am I hearing what I'm hearing? <laughs> and not just once, several times. And the Sanctus, too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm telling you, we get... I think just God gives, and I don't know, maybe he gives it to us, like maybe to me, because I'm a man of weak faith. So you often say, well, why does God allow certain people to experience certain things? And usually God allows those who are very weak in faith. Like Mother Teresa experienced a dark night of the soul of 50 years, like just dryness in her entire life. No spiritual consolation, just utter dryness for 50 years. Why? Because she was an adult in the faith. I'm a kid. You know, God gives me these little bonuses. Same thing with Anna, right? Um, but I'm telling you, it's, it's heaven on earth. That's what we believe. So 274, it's the sum and summary of our faith, our greatest treasure. So the sum and summary of our faith. So our faith could be summed up in the Eucharist. Our faith, a summary of our faith could be just taught in the Eucharist. Now, 282, the mode of presence. I'm going to read this. How is Christ present in the Eucharist? Jesus Christ is present in the Eucharist in a unique and incomparable way. He is present in a true, real, substantial way. I love that. I love that. Like, true, real. It's like, he's really, 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 really present. Okay? In case you don't know that. I'm telling you, the language that, like, you and I wouldn't write a paper like this, but the church has to get this point across. In a true, real, substantial way, with his body and his blood, with his soul and his divinity. In the Eucharist, therefore, there is present... Now look, notice, how is he present in a sacramental way? That is, under the Eucharistic species of bread and wine. Christ whole and entire, God and man. So he's physically present in his physical body. However, his body is glorified, and that body is present in what we call a sacramental pr presence. What is a sacrament? A visible sign of an invisible reality. So it's a sacramental presence. It's how God becomes present to us. So let me read to you 1374 in the Catechism. Just because sometimes this has greater detail. 1374. This is good because I like it. The mode of Christ's presence under the Eucharistic species is unique. It raises the Eucharist above all the sacraments 
as the perfection of the spiritual life and the end of which all sacraments tend. Every sacrament points to the Eucharist, and the Eucharist is the perfection of spiritual life. So, you said when you become a priest, the perfection of the spiritual life will be all summed up in the Masses that you celebrate in the Eucharist, the adoration that you do, and the confessions that you hear to the people to the Eucharist. That's the perfection of the spiritual life. Not in the serving of the poor, not in social justice, all that which is good. The perfection of the spiritual life is in those things. And to, and to not do that is to fail in your priesthood. In the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and blood, together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, therefore the same way we just read it, therefore the whole of Christ is truly, really, substantially contained. This presence is called real, by which is not intended to exclude the other types of presence that they could not be real too, but because it's presence in the fullest sense. So, is God really present here today? Yes. Is God really present in the Bible? Yes. So, the fact that the church uses this doesn't minimize those present, those way of being present. But this is the fullest sense of being present in which God is present to us. That is, to say, it is a substantial presence by which Christ, God and man, makes himself wholly and entirely present. A substantial. I'm not saying that Jesus isn't present where your mom goes to church, or your mom. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that he is not fully, in his fullest presence, substantially present. Because he is only substantially fully present wherever the Eucharist is. And if they don't have or believe in the Eucharist, then that presence isn't there. It's just not. So, the mode of presence, body, blood, and soul, in a sacramental way. 283, question and answer. Uh, let me have Luke, go ahead and read it again. Uh, Transubstantiation means the change of the whole substance of bread into the substance of the body of Christ. And of the whole substance of wine, the substance of his blood. This change is brought about in the Eucharist of prayer through the efficacy of the word of Christ and by the action of the Holy Spirit. However, the outward characteristics of bread and wine, that is the Eucharistic species, remain unaltered. So, the, we're going to talk about transubstantiation. It's in my notes. It's going to come at the end. What I want to say is this. If Christ is present in the Eucharist, then he is present fully, body, blood, sort of any no matter whether you take from the form of bread or you take it in the form of the chalice. So, when I don't receive the chalice, I don't receive the blood. There are several reasons I have for it. I would be okay if the church today in America said, hey, we're only going to give the Eucharist in the form of bread. I, I think no, that, that would be so nice. I think it would be nice. I think, you one, it would, the... it would minimize accidents, minimize extraordinary... A whole, a whole, a whole chalice. Yeah. I, I, I seriously believe... But... Let's say you were going to Mass, like I used to do this with my students, and my students one time noticed, and they're like, Mr. Gallardo, why did the priest give you a bigger piece of Jesus? <laughs> and of course I used to tell them, well, because I'm moldier. <laughs> and you know, the reality is this, it's like, you don't receive more Jesus. He's present in no matter what way you receive, or how big, or how much. Now this is a big question, though, because now you talk about there are people who receive communion in the hand. Now, I know this is a big in the Hispanic cultures. But this is why I am not... You know, there was a time where the Hispanic, Italian, old country, it was unheard of, unheard of, to think for a lay person, a non-ordained person, to touch the Eucharist. I've never in my life right, have received communion in the hand. Now, how have I touched the Eucharist? I have commissioned by a priest in extreme situations. But it's unheard of. If my son goes his whole life and we're touching the Eucharist, like that would be a miracle. Unless he becomes a priest, of course. Um, and why is that? Well, because only ordained hands, you know, there was this theology that was behind it. It was really rich. And if we were to get back to it, I want to have a problem with it. Because I think it's really, I think it has a good place in the philosophy. But people receive in the hand today a lot, or however they receive. And I pose this question. Even if the smallest amount of that bread, of a crumb, were to fall, who would fall? Jesus, body, blood, so on, and maybe Jesus Christ. I actually would do this with my junior high students. I had this black top, like, like this. It was this material, you know this, uh, what is this, like a... Uh, Laminate. Formica? Or what is this thing? Laminate. Laminate, oh, laminate, that's what it is. But it was a black laminate, and so what I would do is I would get a, a, a pack of, of uh, communion hosts, not consecrated, I would open them up, 
And, and the ones I would get are like the tri triple seal, best ones, the best ones you can get. They're the best ones, top dollar, right? I would take them, I would open them, I would spread them out, and then I would pick them all up, and I would tell my students to one by one come up and take a look, and they would see all these little white specks. Little white specks that they would have never seen in their hands, right? Because they're white. You can't see what they're seeing. And yet this is what the church believes, that, that Christ is present whole and entire in every element, no matter how big or how small Christ is present. If you wonder why I have a preference to go into certain masses or certain liturgy, it's because sometimes it's like, this, I want my son to grow up with this. I want my family to grow up with this. Now, this isn't to knock individuals who receive in the hand. I'm not saying that. There isn't one way better than the other. The church allows receiving communion in the hand. Recent, that's a recent allotment, and it was only done by concession. I'll explain this a little bit later. Um, but, I saw the cross silence. Sorry, I used to teach you in my kids. It's something we always do. It's a good habit, so you can pray for them. My son once had one about 12 minutes. He goes, Papa Cyrus. No, yes, uh, this was actually a couple of days ago. The Catechism goes on to say that the Eucharist gives us the graces to unite us more closely to Jesus Christ, to strengthen our souls. It wipes away venial sin and it lessens the inclination to sin. So, you're a man, you're addicted to pornography and addicted to masturbation. Go go to Mass every day. And what's going to happen when you go to Mass every day? It's going to lessen your inclination to do sin. And it's going to fortify you to go to confession and strengthen you. And once you overcome that, the impure thoughts that you get in your head that you can't control or whatever it is, it wipes away all venial sins. Going to communion is a regular, it's like a confession for your venial sins, the small sins. Right? So that's, who wouldn't want to do that? Like literally, who wouldn't want to do that? So, I'm going to stop here. Uh, but as you can see, uh, so we're going to go on. There are a lot of notes. That you, oh, actually, let me just, let me go through this part here. It's only a small part. It's, it's not going to be, don't worry. We're going to, I'll finish one. We're going to get, we're going to get to two. I'm going to be done right now. So I know you're all like tired and hungry. I am too. I'm all those things. However you drive to this class, I know you're, I know how you drive to this class. Oh, I can't believe. Like these guys never, like, yeah, we got to go. I can't believe we got to go. I'm tired. I had a long day at work. I'm hungry. That's exactly how I come to, okay? So I'm suffering with you. I get it. I completely get it, okay? But if I don't teach this, then when I die, God's going to say, why did you get lazy? And just because you got lazy, you get an extra two million years of purgatory. I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want that. I got a couple of friends, and hopefully they remember me when they're in their monastery or celebrating Mass. But I don't have that many. The Eucharist Greek Eucharistia means thanksgiving. Okay? That's what it means. The Hebrew, the baraka, means blessings. So what is the Eucharist? It is a blessing and it is, it is we give thanks to God. I often tell my son this. I'm constantly drilling into my son to be grateful. To be grateful. People who are grateful for their lives, right? They're always happy. Yes. To be grateful. Just grateful. I, my brother used to sleep on the floor. We used to be a big house. I've slept on the floor. Like, I've slept on the floor. Okay? But I always used to think to myself, wow, at least I'm not homeless. At least I'm not on the street. You know, like, I'm grateful. Right? At least I got a roof. I'm living with my family. I got my brothers and sisters. Like, to always have that attitude of gratitude. You can't be bitter and you can't have hate. If you, if you, if you just... And gratitude is a virtue that has to be worked on. You got to work on it. So whenever you're upset... When you're stuck in traffic, when you're staying late, and you gotta drive all the way home, just, I'm grateful at least I have a car with a year. I'm grateful at least I have a car. I'm grateful in life, I'm grateful. You know what I mean? Just, anyways, Eucharist means thanksgiving, blessing. It is the source and summit of our lives. All sacraments are Eucharistic. Everything points to the Eucharist. Everything is heading towards the Eucharist. Everything that God in Christ means to us comes within the Holy Eucharist. Everything that God means, means to us. As Catholics, we believe in the reality of Christ in His humanity and His divinity and in Christ fully present in the Eucharist. And if you do not, then you are not Catholic and buy, I'll see you later. And get your money back, but not for the books and what I spent. In the Eucharist, we experience who we are. By coming in contact with Christ, we come to know ourselves more. Right? Think about that. We experience who we are. St. Augustine prayed until his dying days, Lord, help me know myself. You know, when the apostles met Jesus, who did they come in contact with? Not just Jesus Christ, but with themselves. 
That's pretty good. Think about it, Yusuf, your conversion. You come into contact with Christ. It's been about a year, right? And about a couple of years in, right? In that time, you've come to an encounter of who you are. Yeah, yeah. The reality of who you are, the changing of what you have. Yeah, it's, that's what the Eucharist does. Okay, I said I would stop here, so I'm going to stop. Let's close in prayer. Uh, class next week, we're going to talk about Lent and then Ash Wednesday, and then a lot of fasting and penance. And then now we're going to see what it really needs to be Catholic. Uh, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Finish right, your guys. question, her question earlier. Oh, wait, what was your question? Okay, so, look, I ended the class, so here's what I'm going to do. If you have to leave, fine, walk out. Do not feel bad that you have to walk out, okay? Uh, what was the reading? What's the re Can somebody give me the first reading for this Sunday? Give it to me real quick. It's probably going to be 1 Corinthians. Oh, no, it's the second. The second reading, sorry, yeah. It's 7.32. 1 Corinthians 7 what? 32. 32 to 35? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 32 to 35. Now, I'm going to read it real quick. I'll give a quick answer or a question real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 32 to 35 says the following. 32, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the world. Of the, the unmarried man is about the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about the worldly affairs, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried women, or virgins, are anxious about the fear of the Lord. And so I'm about to say, verse 35, I say this for your benefit, not to lay any restrictions upon you, but to promote good order and to, se to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Paul is basically saying this, to be a priest or a nun is better than to be a married man or a married woman. So when he talks about being single, he's talking about the religious life on single, not like just being single. He's talking about to dedicate yourself to do the things of God. Here's why. Anybody here who's married, me, Eddie, you, you're going to get married, you, you're going to get married. I mean, Eddie's thinking about, he's got daughter soccer, he's got quinceaneras, he's got bills to pay. That's just the reality. That's part of his vocation. He has to do that. He can't. If Eddie were to start coming to Mass every day and being before the Blessed Sacrament three hours a day, he would not be pleasing God. Because he has a wife and kids to go to. And so what Paul is saying, for those of you who have a choice, he's basically saying this, look, this one's better. But he goes on to say, whoever's called to this, becoming a priest, a nun, that's, you do it because God calls you. And if he's calling you to get married, then just know this, being close to God is going to be a lot difficult. It's going to be a lot more difficult. And that's true. As a married man, I used to go to Mass every day, Holy Hour every day. I mean, I was, I told you, I was the holiest man. I was, just, I was really like a saint. And then I married my wife and I had kids and I was like, I can barely pray for Rosary every day. So that's kind of what he's saying. All right, guys, go. You can leave. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. God bless. Pray for me. I'll pray for you and I'll see you next week. Bye bye. Oh, yes. Andrew, wake up. Wake up. Andrew, wake up.